In 1996, flash engineering, or shall we say sign racing, was born, and that was part of Volvo's racing team. Polestar was very much the same sort of aspect. It was the performance line within the manufacturer's line of vehicles, and we've seen Polestar engineered Volvo vehicles for a numerous amount of years. However, the Polestar 2 is the first all-electric vehicle that comes from the manufacturer. You might be wondering, well, why is there called something called Polestar, and why is it not called Volvo Polestar? And that's because the Polestar brand became its own brand in 2017, and that was a decision that Geely Motors made. Now, Geely Motors is a Chinese automaker that acquired Volvo and all its subsidiary brands back in 2010, and therefore the Polestar 2 is solely built and manufactured in China. Now, despite not having much of a brand awareness for your average Joe, the Polestar vehicle actually is not cheap. In fact, in the UK, it costs £49,900 without the plug-in grant. And thankfully, given it's just under £50,000, it qualifies for a £3,000 plug-in grant and therefore can be found for £46,900. Of course, without any options such as the performance pack, which we've got over here, and indeed the colour, which is a £900 option. So in this review, we're going to be looking to see if it's worth your money and furthermore, how it compares to some of its rivals. Now, if you'd like even more detail than this video review will produce, do check out our written review will be down in the description below. Also down there, you'll find links to our social media platforms. So if you're on Instagram or Twitter, for example, definitely do give us a follow as it will give you the opportunity to keep up with the latest news and reviews from Totally EV. And furthermore, if you do like this video, give it a like and of course subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you can keep up with, again, the video reviews that come from the channel. So to kick off this review, we're going to talk about two trivial factors. Well, potentially not trivial, let me know in the comments below. First off, it's the key fob. Now, while some people might want to rely on the app that Polestar provide, I personally prefer to have a physical key fob in my hand when I'm unlocking or locking the vehicle. And in this respect, it just feels really cheap. It feels like it's been kind of 3D printed, which I've got nothing wrong against, but I just wish a little bit more attention to detail was given to the physical key fob and made it feel like a bit more of a premium experience when approaching a £50,000 vehicle. Now elsewhere you've got two stickers located by the front side of the doors and here they can be removed but again it does kind of beg the question as to why vehicles are being delivered with a removal sticker which says Polestar 2 78 kilowatt hour battery and 300 kilowatts of power. I just don't understand its inclusion and if you're going to be loaning or say renting the vehicle you might have to consider or ask your dealer if you're actually allowed to remove the sticker because that's how it comes if you're getting the car brand new. Now on the plus side the exterior design is spectacular. No matter who I asked in terms of their age they all agree to say that the Polestar 2 looks fantastic. From the front you're treated with a kind of Volvo design from the LED headlights to the front cutoff bumper. At this side, you've got 19 inch alloys that come as standard. And if you go for the performance pack or indeed within an option, you can get 20 inch alloys like the ones that we've got pictured. There's also plastic side skirts and wheel arches, which I'm normally not a fan of. However, in this respect, it does blend in really well with the overall profile of the vehicle and doesn't detract from the overall design. As for the rear of the vehicle, to me, it reminds me of an American muscle car. It's got this aggressive, sporty look to it, but also combines a more few futuristic design given the tail light extends all the way across the rear of the vehicle. Truthfully, on the whole, whatever Polestar's design team has done over here should really be applauded. And I think most people would agree that they would like to be seen driving the Polestar 2 in comparison to the Tesla equivalent or even the VW equivalent. Of course, that is very much subjective. So do let me know in the comments below what you make of it. Now, moving inside the vehicle, it's got a Volvo-esque design, which is very much a plus point in my books because it's not only looks premium, but also feels it as well from the dashboard design or even in terms of the panoramic glass roof. There are, however, a few annoyances which I'm going to outline first before we get onto the things I actually do quite like about the interior design. First off, in terms of the dashboard, it does extend quite well, but the edges are a little bit sharp. And while it might not seem that important to some people who are a little bit shorter, for those people who've got either longer legs or a little bit larger, what you'll find is that getting in and out of the vehicle might be a little bit hard because the kind of sides almost poke out. As for the panoramic glass roof that I talked about, there's no sunshade, so you can't actually block out the sun 
permanently if you so wish. Of course it is tinted to a certain degree but for those people who live in very hot climates you might find it a little bit annoying and might want to look into kind of third party solutions. Elsewhere you've got the center console which has got a quite minimalistic type of design however it's a little bit too large for my liking and kind of kind of extends towards your legs specifically if you're the driver with longer legs like myself. As for the armrest, it's adjustable but doesn't actually lock into place so therefore if you've got kind of a heavy arm you'll find it kind of swaying about each time which isn't exactly what you'd like to feel on again a £50,000 vehicle. Now elsewhere it's a shame not to see a head-up display featured on the Polestar 2 and the reason I say that is because Volvo has a pretty good integration with their head-up display on their vehicles so it would be nice to see that kind of translated on the Polestar 2 where Gilu Motors could have actually integrated that. However, other than these small little annoyances, the interior design is spectacular. As I mentioned before, it does look really nice, but it's also quite practical. Take the steering wheel, for example. It's really easy to grip. It's got a good sort of size and weight to it. It's fully adjustable as well. And on the left-hand side, you've got buttons to adjust your cruise control settings. And on the right-hand side, you've got media control buttons and also the ability to flick through the different screens on your instrument cluster. Speaking of which, the 12.3 inch fully digital instrument cluster is a thing of marvel. Not only does it display all the information you want, but also fully integrates with Android Auto. And we'll talk about Android integration in just a bit. Now moving on, we've got the center console. And other than being a little bit oversized from what I mentioned before, it's got this minimalistic type of look and very kind of Scandinavian type of design. Take, for example, the gear selector. It's just really small, really well designed, and has also got a little illuminated Polestar logo which adds a little bit of extra class. Being about a Polestar logo there's another one projected towards the top over here which won't be, be able to be seen from the front of the vehicle but if you sit at the back or indeed if you're in like let's say a police chase and you've got a chopper uh, following you from the top then they'll be able to see that it's very much a Polestar vehicle from the top of the car. As for the center console and more of a practical type of use case you have got a wireless charging bay which works on and off with my Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus and you've got two type C ports. It would have been nice to see a 12 volt socket for charging let's say a dash cam and by the way if you're interested in dash cams we've got a roundup it'll be down in the description below on our website or alternatively a type A port which would be more well, handy for those people using all the devices and unfortunately there's no type C to type A adapter provided within the vehicle so you'll have to purchase one yourself if you so wish. Now lower down the center console you have got a cup holder which reveals when you slide down the armrest and as I mentioned before it doesn't really lock into place and if you open up the compartment you've got another cup holder space or a little place to put let's say the key fob which is quite handy to say the least. Now one thing that really does stand out and that that's kind of propped at the middle of the center console, or should I say the dashboard, is its 11.15 inch display, which integrates Google's automotive OS. So therefore you have Google Maps, you've got Google Assistant, and you can do certain voice commands. Let's say, hey Google, turn up the fan to max. Got it, changing the fan speed to the highest. So it integrates with certain car functions as well by not only just answering questions. Hey Google, turn off the fan. It. Turning off fan. Hey Google, how much does the Polestar 2 cost? The Polestar 2 is listed by the manufacturer at a starting price of £49,900. Indeed, so you can use this voice commands to your advantage to answer basic questions or indeed operate certain functionalities of the car and I think here Google Assistant in my opinion is the best voice assistant there is on the market in, in the way it picks up your accent or your tone and picks up all the words that you want and even complex answers it's able to answer for you as well. So in terms of a car standpoint of view there is kind of pros and cons to it. The pro is the fact that it integrates Google Maps natively and it also translates to the instrument cluster so you can actually see your navigation data all via the instrument cluster which means that you don't have to really glance at the screen but on more of a con it's more the fact in terms of privacy. If you don't want Google to be integrated within your vehicle you won't have the choice with the Polestar 2. It's just baked into the vehicle system and there's no way of 
removing Google services, so to speak. And this might pose a problem for those people who are worried about privacy and security because you can disable the Hey Google activation, but you can't fully disable Google's services because, well, Polestar have chosen to partner up with Google in order to make the Polestars 2 automotive OS. Now, as for iPhone users, Apple CarPlay isn't quite available just yet, although it's coming at a later date. And instead, you'll have to resort on Bluetooth connectivity only, where you can synchronize your contacts or indeed play back some media. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, purely for you to experience the 13 speaker Harman Kardon system that's comprised within the Polestar 2. It comes as standard and the 600 watts surround sound speakers do a phenomenal job in terms of portraying an accurate and very much a powerful punchy sound. Now, if you'd like a more detailed review of the audio system, do check it up on your pop-up banner or indeed down in the description below where you'll see a detailed written review of the audio system on our website. Now onto comfort, the Polestar 2 will seat up to five occupants and at the rear, the middle seat is a little bit stiff. However, if you're not gonna use it, it can reveal an armrest and you can even find two cup holder spaces. But that's not all because rear occupants do have climate control controls and two Type-C ports as well and even the rear seats can be heated which is quite a rarity in most modern day vehicles. Onto the seats themselves they're made out of a vegan material which is quite refreshing to see although you can opt for the leather option if you prefer. What I do like here is that legroom is plentiful at the rear and at the front of the cabin. Now headroom is a little bit more limited at the back where I'm just under six foot. So if someone's around six foot four, they might feel a little bit hemmed in, but that's not the same that could be set at the front of the cabin. Actually at the front, you've got two electronically adjustable seats that come as standard and the seats actually recline all the way back, which basically mean that you can pretty much sleep in the Polestar 2 if you wish, or gaze up in the stars as you can enjoy the views via the panoramic glass roof. In terms of storage within the cabin, you have got these mesh compartments found within the rear segment of the front seats. You've got small compartments found within the rear doors and slightly larger ones found at the front where they can fit a 500 milliliter bottle. It's slightly a shame that large sized purses, for example, will struggle to fit within the center armrest. However, a normal sized wallet will fit here with ease. Now, another thing I do want to point out and something I did notice in terms of the same behavior on the VW ID3, and in case you're interested in that review, by the way, it'll be up on your pop-up banner, is the fact that the driver's seat has a pressure sensor, which is great if you're the driver stepping inside the vehicle, everything will kind of power on for you and be ready for you to use. And of course, when you step outside the vehicle, you don't have to faff around with any buttons. The only negative side about this is that if you have rear occupants who are gonna be remaining in the car while you're away as the driver, it means they'll be treated with no climate controls or infotainment system that will be enabled, which can be quite cumbersome, specifically if you have kids and you want to keep them entertained while you're quickly nipping out and getting, let's say, a, a chocolate bar or something like that from the local grocery store. Now, moving on to the boot, there's two ways of operating it, which might not seem quite intuitive at first, but once you get used to it, it's actually pretty handy. You've got the key fob, which a lot of manufacturers offer, and you've also got a kind of kickstand, which where it opens up electronically. I actually found it to be pretty responsive in terms of my input. At uh, not one point did I feel that I couldn't find it the the sensor picking up my foot no matter how dirty the vehicle got furthermore in terms of closing it it's two electronic buttons found over here one of which allows you to close and lock at the same time and the other one just to close which again is pretty handy to say the least in terms of capacity you've got 41 liters which is found underneath the boot floor and if you include the total boot floor as well you've got 405 liters Really in total over here, it doesn't really equate to the likes of the Tesla Model 3 or some of its other competitors, but it's still plenty enough to do your weekly shop. Volvo have also integrated kind of like a, a stand over here, which kind of opens up and allows you to, let's say, compartmentalize the rear boot, which is in my opinion, quite handy and just really well thought out. Now, if you were to prop down the seats, you've got 1,095 liters, which is quite nice to see. And again, not as good as its competitors, but should be plentiful for most people. There's also a 60-40 split with the rear seat, allowing you to customize in terms of how much space you need. And the seats also do lay flat, which is really handy for, let's say, placing larger goods. Now, if you do have elongated goods and you still want to transport four people, including yourself as the driver, you can do so because it's got a middle compartment within the middle seat, which opens up and therefore allows you to place, let's say, a set of skis through it. Now, at the front of the vehicle, you do also have 35 litres of space. 
given it's an all-electric vehicle there's no combustion engine over here however i would have liked to see a little bit more extra storage space where it allows you to actually let's say place a small little bag instead of really you're going to be using this space only for your charging cables and that's not necessarily a bad thing however opening and closing the bonnet isn't quite intuitive as you might expect from any sort of vehicle you kind of have to prop it open from the front as you would do on a normal ic based vehicle and in terms of closing the bonnet what i actually found is that you kind of have to slam it in order for it to close shut in the first instance often when i was getting the charging cables out so i really had to slam it hard and if i didn't i'd have to kind of prop my my two hands almost kind of giving a cpr to the bonnet in order to close it a little bit properly and now we get on to driving and the first thing i want to talk about is the external noise that the vehicle produces there is a slight sort of hum sound and that can be heard from the exterior and if you're going to be reversing there's kind of a small beeping sound almost like a, a truck almost reversing in so again it's alerting pedestrians that there is an electric vehicle as it can't be heard now within the cabin there is quite an interesting way that polestar have integrated the audio system whereby if you come to a standstill like we did now and if I had music playing music would dip which I find a little bit distracting and when you start going again the music will come back up again I'm not really sure if this is to do with a setting or something like that but it seems like I couldn't find the setting to adjust it through the Polestar infotainment system nevertheless when it comes to cabin noise there is a very little amount of noise that you can be heard um, from the exterior by that I mean it comes to wind noise there's very little wind noise that can be heard deflecting off the a pillars however you will pick up some road noise that kicks in now we have got the 20 inch rims and therefore I'm not really sure if it would depend in terms of if you have the 19 inch option instead if that would reduce tire noise but at least in this model the one that I'm testing with the performance pack there is tire noise that can definitely be heard and specifically when you're going to be driving on the motorway you'll hear it creeping in and might take I don't know, a little bit of the joy out of um, driving longer distance drives because you'll be a bit more distracted by the road around you now on the plus side the driving a height is absolutely fantastic I did talk about the comfort of the seats but also in terms of the height of them themselves it's actually really perfect I think here is just due to the fact that the batteries are integrated really well and have been really well designed and therefore the floor doesn't feel too heightened and as a result you can pretty much bring down the seat pretty low to your heart's content and makes it feel almost like a sports vehicle and when that comes to visibility this also does play a massive role when it comes to driving in and around the city as we are doing now because you've got fantastic visibility both at the front the side and at the rear and that also comes with the integration of certain safety features that Polestar has integrated and we'll talk about safety further down in this review what I do want to mention in this part however is that when it comes to parking the vehicle comes as standard with 360 degree cameras making a parking well pretty much a breeze you've also got park assist as well where you've got sensors which will notify you of well how close you are to objects from the front or the side of the vehicle which is something that it's nice to see integrated as a standard option and something that you don't have to customize again you might potentially expect this in a £50,000 vehicle but again it's nice to see that Polestar have integrated this as standard and it's not something you have to purchase as an additional option. Now similarly in terms of the side view mirrors they've got a frameless design which is just really nice to see and adds to kind of the overall design the aesthetics from the exterior but it also does play a part when you're actually glancing at your side view mirrors because it's just a little less distracting. Now they are electronically adjustable they're heated as well but it's also nice to see that they do both tilt down when you're reversing you can of course adjust this you can have it only on the passenger side you can have it disabled altogether or you can have both the driver and the passenger side both tilting down at the same time each time you pop into reverse which is just a nice little touch and something that you don't see many manufacturers integrating and it's just great to see that Polestar has addressed this um, yet again in terms of as a standard feature. So what about when it comes to performance? Well the Polestar 2 has two motors which each of them output 150 kilowatts of power equating to 300 kilowatts that equates to 408 horsepower. Now, top speed is limited to 127 miles an hour 
and in terms of its 0 to 60 time, I had it tested via Race Logic's V Box Sport at 4.68 seconds. And I did this a multitude of times, and just by putting my foot down on the accelerator pedal, there's no need to put it on a certain mode, there's no need for you to put your foot down on the brake and have launch control, for example. It just does it every single time. Better still, in terms of the overall torque, you've got 660 newton meters of readily available torque. And the beauty of this is that you will feel it at zero miles an hour, or for example, if you're doing an overtake maneuver from 50 to 70 miles an hour, and it's just fantastic to feel it because the way that the motors work together is absolutely seamless and one that makes you really feel that you are driving more of a performance type of vehicle. Now, this is of course all very impressive but it doesn't really compete with the likes of the Tesla Model 3, which not only will get to a faster 60 miles an hour, but is also not limited to 127 miles an hour in terms of its top speed limitations. The thing which will catch people out over here when it comes to the Polestar 2 is its handling characteristics. And for me, this is where the car really does shine. Here it's got an all-wheel drive and therefore it gives you plenty of confidence when you're chucking the car at speed on country roads. Even if you're not doing that, you just feel safe in the cabin. The weight distribution is done really well. It's got a 51% weight distribution at the front and 49% at the rear, almost a 50-50 split, and it just feels great when, again, you're driving at speed. Furthermore, the steering wheel itself has just got a nice weight to it and a nice size to it. While it isn't as nimble as the likes of the Tesla, I think on the whole here, the vehicle has done really well in terms of how it's been set up. Now on that subject, we have got the performance pack, which is a 5,000 pound option. And truthfully, I don't think most people will actually want it other than having a bit more confidence with your brakes because at the front, so you've got four piston Brembo brakes, but it's weird to see that despite having a performance pack, the rear brakes are kept standard. On that subject, it's also a little bit strange that in terms of for you to adjust the suspension, the Olin's dampeners, they are manually adjustable and therefore means a little bit of an odd type of customization. I just can't expect people who are buying a £50,000 vehicle not to expect a little setting through the infotainment system which would allow you to essentially adjust the suspension. Instead, it's a manual adjustment. So most people will not want to bother with it but for those people getting the performance pack you're probably looking to adjust the suspension and as a result you'll want to bring it to potentially its minimum setting for you to have a hardened suspension and therefore more of a track feel but for pretty much everyone else and most people who are even driving at country roads at speed, you'll probably want to leave it at its standard or even more of the comfort setting because, well, the vehicle suspension setup is just really well done as a standard mode. So while the performance pack does add a few little features, I don't think most people will really appreciate them. And furthermore, don't really feel that it's worth the overall 5,000 pound asking price that Polestar are looking to achieve by charging it to its consumers. Now, the biggest thing over here that you should consider is the overall all-electric range that you get. Now, Polestar claimed that you get a 292 mile on a single charge, and you could achieve that by driving quite comfortably and also within inner city commutes. However, realistically, people are gonna be driving on the motorway like we are doing now, and also taking it to the city, and also to the country roads. In our mixed driving test, that's exactly what we do. We leave the climate controls on, we have the radio playing as well, and we just use it as a normal user would do. In this respect, what we found is that the overall range sat around the 200 mile mark, which truthfully isn't all that impressive, given that some of its competitors, namely Tesla, offer a longer range, or alternatively, have the similar type of range, but cost around 10,000 pounds less. Take, for example, the VW ID3, which is a different class of vehicle in all, in all things considered, 
but it will offer around 200 miles of range as well. And it kind of begs the question, why does the Polestar 2 cost upwards of £46,000? Now to recharge the vehicle, the Polestar 2 supports the CCS input, which is capable of up to 150 kilowatt input charge, which will take you from zero to 80% in roughly 40 minutes. Should you go for a 50 kilowatt DC input, which is more commonly found on the motorway, here it will go from zero to 80% in roughly 80 minutes. Now it's not as well integrated as the Tesla supercharger network and there's no doubt about it. And here in this respect, yet again, it's a shame that Polestar haven't integrated a faster input charge. So for example, up to 250 kilowatt input or potentially up to 350 kilowatt. Maybe that'll come via firmware update like Tesla did. But at the time of doing this review, you're limited to up to 150 kilowatt input. Now, most people I can't see actually wanting to use a DC input because they'll want to reduce their costs and charges when it comes to recharging and therefore will want to plug it in at home. Now the car supports both three phase charger and also your regular seven kilowatt input and this will take it from around 11 hours down to around seven hours from zero to a hundred percent charge. So again you might have to be a little bit more tactical when you're charging the vehicle but bearing in mind it's got a 78 kilowatt hour battery it does take some time. Now what is really well done is the regen to braking levels. There are three to choose from and again they're very easily accessible through the infotainment system. Off is essentially like coasting, low has a little bit of braking, where standard, the mode I actually prefer, really does break the vehicle to a complete standstill. And this is fantastic in my opinion because it allows you to have a true one pedal driving approach. And it's nice that unlike some of its competitors that you've got to, the option to customize it. It's not like you have an on or off button you've got a middle section as well, a middle option shall we say, and one that essentially will appeal to those people coming to an electric vehicle for the first time. Now the thing that really does stand out for me is the fact that the Polestar 2 is very safe to drive. You might expect this given the fact it is a Volvo vehicle after all. The car recently achieved five star in Euro NCAP's pretty strict 2020 test cycle. And it also has a variety of different driver assistance systems, blind spot assist, rear cross traffic alert, which essentially alerts you when there's some sort of object that's um, at the back of your vehicle that potentially would have been out of your line of sight. It's also got emergency brake assist as what the name might suggest. And it's also got adaptive cruise control, which actually works a treat. When I was on the motorway, the adaptive cruise control worked really well in terms of adjusting the speed um, in comparison to the vehicle that was in front of me. Furthermore, the lane keep assistance was also extremely well done. The wheel steam seems pretty well done in terms of how it adjusts and it keeps the car pretty well planted in the middle of the lane rather than kind of swaying from left and right. Something that you see some other systems doing and it was just nice to see that the Polestar 2 was just a breeze to drive on the motorway with all the safety features enabled and it made me feel a little bit more comfortable so knowing that the car is also safe that in case I was to be in a collision or an accident then I would be safe and protected and so would all my occupants as well. And so this all leads me on to my verdict. What do I make about the Polestar 2? Well, quite frankly, it does tick a lot of boxes. It's got a stylish exterior and interior design. It's got fantastic tech integration with the likes of Google Automotive OS. And fundamentally, it's very fun to drive. However, it's all electric range is a little bit of a letdown. And if you consider the fact that you can get the Tesla Model 3 long range variant for around the same price, including the options, it gives you, well, a little bit more food for thought to say the least. Furthermore, if you look elsewhere, you've got a different class of car, such as the VW ID3, which also offers a fantastic all-electric range and something that's very practical and also familiar for a lot of people. So really, in my opinion, I would say look at some of its alternatives and consider the Polestar 2 as a worthy alternative, but probably not the best all-electric vehicle in its class that you can currently buy. At least that's just my opinion and thoughts about it. So do let me know in the comments below what you make of it. And of course, if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification so you can see more honest, independent reviews from Totally EV. And of course, favorite and share if you feel that this video will be helpful for a family and friend making an informed buying decision. All right, I've been Chris from Totally EV. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.